Metal Slug. Throughout the 80s and 90s, one of the biggest names in arcades was SNK. The company was founded in 1978 by Akichi Kawasaki after seeing Japan's burgeoning arcade industry convinced him to form a studio called Shin Nihon Kikaku, or in English, New Japan Project. Their early titles such as Safari Rally and Osmo Wars were mild successes, but their first major hit wasn't until 1981 with Vanguard. As the American games industry crashed in the mid-80s, Japan was left unscathed, leaving SNK to continue releasing arcade hits from Athena, Akari Warriors, and Alpha Mission. When Nintendo launched the NES between 1985 and 86, SNK was one of the first five licensees to port their arcade titles to the system. But as the 80s came to a close, SNK would kick off the next decade in style. On April 26, 1990, the Neo Geo multi-video system made its debut in arcades across Japan. Its 16 and 8-bit processors could display 4,000 colors and 380 sprites simultaneously. Unlike traditional cabinets, games weren't built into the hardware, but came on 330 megabit cartridges. A single cabinet could hold up to six games, saving arcade owners both money and floor space. But the MVS wasn't alone. A console version called the Advanced Entertainment System was released on the same day as a rental. Consumers wouldn't get to own one until the following year when it launched with two arcade controllers and one game for 600 US dollars. With a high price point in graphics that blew away the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo, the AES was considered the Rolls Royce of game consoles, being only available to young adults with disposable income or kids with rich parents. Early titles such as Magician Lord and Nam 1975 were popular picks, but another genre would soon dominate the system. In 1991, Capcom unleashed Street Fighter II into arcades, quickly becoming a worldwide phenomenon. SNK responded with their own line of fighters, starting with Fatal Fury, and followed up with others such as Art of Fighting, Samurai Showdown, and their yearly crossover event, The King of Fighters. Between 1991 and 2004, the Neo Geo saw a total of 53 fighting games, igniting a rivalry with Capcom that later grew into its own series. But as things were looking up for SNK, another arcade developer in Osaka was going through struggles of their own. In 1994, Irem, best known for arcade classics such as Kung Fu Master and R-Type, was going through a major restructuring after several financial losses. When they ceased all game development at the end of the year, developers began breaking off into groups with plans of leaving for other companies like Sega and Capcom. However, one group in particular had their eyes set on SNK. Previously, they had developed games such as Major Title, Gun Force 2, and In the Hunt. Impressed by their past work, SNK agreed to fund the fledgling studio, now under the new name Nazca Corporation. Nazca. The company consisted of only 18 people, many of whom were credited by their nicknames in order to prevent industry rivals from hiring them. To this day, many have remained anonymous, but others have come forward such as Kazuma Kujo, Shinichi Hamada, Atsushi Kuruka, Kazuhiro Tanaka, and Takasushi Hiyomuta. Initially, the company worked on Neo Geo ports to the Sega Saturn and PlayStation, but were allowed to develop games for the MVS on the side, with their first title being Neo Turf Master. Their second was an action game, combined with aspects of beat-em-ups and shooters. 
for Nazca, the game just had to be three things. Comical, challenging, and cool. They took inspiration from anime such as Mobile Suit Gundam, Galaxy Express 999, and Akira. Though never officially confirmed, fans have speculated that both Dominion and Patlabor played a role in the series' development. But their biggest inspiration came from the book Daydream Data Notes by legendary animator Hayao Miyazaki. His sketches of fantasy planes, ships, and tanks inspired Nazca to the point where they later renamed one of their protagonists after a character from the book. Nazca wanted to push the Neo Geo to its absolute limit, even if it caused their debugging units to occasionally catch on fire. In an interview for the book Metal Slug, The Ultimate History, Shinichi Hamada recalled one of these incidents. With Metal Slug, we had a Neo Geo test board with a load of 8 4 megabit RAMs plugged in. And because we used all 32 megabits, updating it took ages. But the hardware division at Nazca developed two prototype RAM boards that we could update much quicker. After that, we used them exclusively. One for the beta version and one for the debug version. But they were only prototypes, so if we overuse them, they catch fire. Once Kui-chan was testing the game and it caught fire. He jumped up and everyone shouted, are you all right? But they meant the RAM board, not him. Regardless, the team worked fast and efficiently on what was a side project while their main focus was on console ports. After a few months of work, Metal Slug was first play tested at two arcades in Osaka and at the JAMA Amusement Machine Show in August of 1995. But what the public saw was not the game we all know. Initially, it had players only controlling a tank piloted by an engineer named Phil John and his partner Michiko Nakajima. This phantom game has been dubbed by fans as Metal Slug Zero. While the press loved it, players didn't share the same feelings. It was slow and difficult, with most not even getting past Mission 3. The public response shook SNK's faith in the project, forcing them to call an emergency meeting with Nazca. That's when planner Kazuma Kujo suggested swapping the tank for a soldier. Neither Nazca or SNK liked the idea, as it meant going against their vision and radically changing the game. But with the development cycle going into its second year, SNK felt they had no choice but to accept it, giving Nazca an extra six months to make all necessary changes. Levels had to be scrapped or completely redone with new weapons and enemies. Developers worked 16 to 18 hours a day while only getting a few hours of sleep under their desks. Some were so sleep deprived that a few were found in hallways and elevators passed out from exhaustion. The team were also dealt another blow when Takeshi Akui left after accepting a position at Squaresoft. Though he would go on to become a background designer on Final Fantasy VII, he regretted not seeing the game to completion. After six months of sheer hell, Metal Slug Super Vehicle 001 made its debut in the US on April 18, 1996, and in Japanese arcades the following day. Set in the far future of 2028, players took control of Marco Rossi and Tarma Roving, members of the elite Peregrine Falcon Squad. The duo were sent to track down Donald Morden, a rogue general who declared war on the governments of the world. His rebel forces raided a base containing metal slugs, experimental light tanks with enough firepower to turn the tide of war in his favor. Players blasted through six levels of highly detailed environments including steamy jungles, occupied cities, winter tundras, and heavily fortified cliffs. You started with only 10 grenades, a knife for close quarters combat, and a pistol that could be swapped out for more powerful weapons. Heavy machine gun! Sprayed rapid fire shots. Shotgun! Turned enemies into red mist. Flame shot! Immolated anything in its path. And rocket launcher! could take out tanks with ease. They could be found in crates or left behind by rescued POWs, but would disappear when you lost a life. But the real gem was the game's signature metal slug. Armed with a turret and a cannon, they could take out whole squads of enemies. However, it wasn't impervious to enemy fire, as it could only take a few shots before exploding. Without it, you were vulnerable to one-hit kills, but driving the Metal Slug to the end of a level in one piece awarded you with 10,000 points and an extra thousand for every rescued POW. Despite all the carnage on display, 
Metal Slug had a sense of humor. Enemies will laugh when you died, only to then run away in terror if you chose to continue. Boss encounters were just as comically exaggerated, taking up half the screen and putting player skills to the test. With enough patience and quarters, players could face off against Morden in a climactic final battle in a helicopter. Mission complete. In the US, Metal Slug was one of the top 10 highest grossing arcade games of 1996, while SNK's European division reported over 5,000 orders two times higher than the average Neo Geo game. It has received numerous ports over the years. Neo Geo owners brought it home a month later on May 26th, it debuted on the Neo Geo CD on July 5th, and made its way to the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn the following year. The Neo Geo CD, PlayStation, and Sega Saturn ports all included an extra mode called Combat School, which had players taking on side missions overseen by drill instructor Sophia Greenville. Players were given ranks depending on how well they did, with the highest being Super Devil. Exclusive to the PlayStation version was an extra mode called Another Story. The series of mini-games followed three POWs during the events of Marco and Tarma's adventure. It was later ported to the PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable, Nintendo Wii, PlayStation Vita, PlayStation 3, iOS, Android, Windows, and Linux. Hamster brought it to the Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4 as part of their Arcade Archive series, the latter of which is backwards compatible on PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S. In addition, it was included on the Neo Geo X Gold, Mini, Arcade Stick Pro, MVSX, and numerous cloud services. No matter which platform you played it on, Metal Slug has continued to be a timeless classic that's still challenging players to this day. With two hits under their belt, SNK formally purchased Nazca at the end of 1996 and greenlit a sequel in early 97. Sadly, Cujo left before development began, choosing to rejoin IREM to rebuild their game division. This left co-creator Meher as the sole project lead, a daunting task as the team had doubled in just under a year. Unlike the first game, this time the development cycle would only last a few months. Gameplay mechanics and graphics were reused along with new additions, some of which were scrapped from the first game. Metal Slug 2 debuted at the Amusement Machine Operators Union Show in early 1998, launching in arcades worldwide on February 23rd of that year. Despite his defeat at the end of the first game, Morden had survived and rebuilt his army in a miraculously short amount of time. Once again, the Peregrine Falcon squad was sent in to handle the situation, but they weren't alone. Joining them were members of the Sparrows, including the bespectacled Theo Jeremy and the blonde bombshell Eri Kasumoto. The added characters meant they were no longer tied to player one or two, as you can now choose who you wanted to fight with at the beginning of the game and at the continue screen. The level count remained the same, but with new locations, including deserts, ruins, trains, and subways. Enemies expanded to include bandits, mummies, and mutants, alongside classic rebel forces. Old weapons returned along with a new laser that fired a deadly beam of light. Grenades can now be upgraded to fire bombs with the metal slug getting armored piercing rounds. In addition, there were now new slugs to control. Camel slugs couldn't be destroyed but had no cannons. Slugnoids could jump high, and the slug flyer took to the sky. In addition, two new NPCs would help player on their adventure. POW Hayakotaro Ichimonji fought back with blue fireballs, while the wandering sergeant Rumi Aikawa dropped items. New to the series were character transformations. Purple gas mummified players, while eating too much made you obese. They severely lowered your mobility, but were not permanent and could be reversed by taking certain items or getting killed. 
During the final mission, it was revealed that the Rebels' quick recovery was the work of Martians that had crash-landed in between the first and second game. But the aliens double-crossed them, revealing their own plans for world domination and kidnapping Morden. With the fate of the planet hanging in the balance, the Peregrine Falcons, Sparrows, and Rebels formed a quick alliance against the alien threat. In a scene straight out of Independence Day, a rebel plane blew up their mothership and freed Morden. Almost unharmed. Despite its many improvements over the first game, Metal Slug 2 suffered from the worst slowdown of any title on the Neo Geo. This was caused by the game being locked at 30 frames per second, leading to a glitch that doubled and tripled the number of frames dropped when too many sprites were on screen. For many, this made the game nearly unplayable, but thankfully a fixed version was released almost a year later as Metal Slug X. X not only fixed the slowdown, but added a ton of new features. New weapons included the Iron Lizard, Drop Shot, Enemy Chaser, Stone. The older weapons received a boost in power and range, with new versions of mummies and aliens that were much harder to kill and more destructive. Levels received a complete makeover, with different times of day, rearranged bosses, increased difficulty, and a new announcer. The whole experience felt like an entirely new game. Both Metal Slug 2 and X have been ported to numerous platforms, including the AES, PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable, Nintendo Wii, PlayStation 3, iOS, Android, PC, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, Xbox Series X and S, and PlayStation 5. The Neo Geo CD only saw the first sequel, with X released on the PS1. Regardless of which one you chose, Metal Slug 2 and X took the formula established in the original and improved upon it in every single way. Mission complete! As Metal Slug 2 was making the rounds in arcades, SNK entered new territory. Since 1989, the handheld market had been dominated by Nintendo's Game Boy. Attempts by Sega, Atari, and NEC to dethrone the house Tetris built had all failed, and dropped out of the market by the mid-90s. SNK saw this as an opportunity to enter the market with their own handheld. The Neo Geo Pocket debuted in Japan and Europe at the end of 1998. While the 16-bit black-and-white handheld was impressive, it was rendered obsolete by the launch of the Game Boy Color months earlier. Anticipating this, SNK had an RGB upgrade ready five months later as the Neo Geo Pocket Color, and unlike its predecessor, it would see a release in North America. Neo Geo hits were shrunk down to a portable format, and while this wasn't the first time for Fatal Fury and Samurai Showdown, which had both seen ports to the Game Boy, it would be for Metal Slug, with First Mission releasing in spring of 1999. It was developed by Yuki Ode, who had previously ported Samurai Showdown 3 and King of Fighters 97 to the PlayStation. As a prequel to the entire series, First Mission focused on an unnamed Peregrine Falcon recruit whose mission was to infiltrate the island base of General Hildegard, a regular army turncoat selling arms to the rebels. While it retained much of the fast and frantic gameplay of past games, slight changes were made to accommodate its newfound portability. 
you now had a life bar that let you take 4 hits, and the number of levels jumped up to 17. They were much shorter than their arcade counterparts, but added more exploration. Since the pocket systems only had two buttons, grenades had to be toggled on with the option. Classic weapons returned, as did the Metal Slug and Slug Flyer. The only new weapon was a super shot that wiped out every enemy on screen. Most items just added to your score, but some added permanent upgrades. Metals increased your health. Coins added more continues, and magazines raised your ammo count. Upon completion, players could unlock a female recruit for replays. First Mission was a much shorter game, with playthroughs clocking in at just under an hour. Thankfully, it wouldn't be the only one for the pocket color, as the sequel came out almost a year later. Metal Slug Second Mission Second Mission launched on March 9, 2000, making it the first entry in the series released in the 21st century. Players could choose between two characters, the new PF recruit Gimlet or the intelligence agent Red Eye. Levels and weapons were entirely divided between them. The shotgun was exclusive to Gimlet while Red Eye received missile pods. The branching mission structure from the first game returned with a total of over 38 missions. The duo were after Lieutenant Commander Makuba, who took over General Garn's operations after his defeat with the help of aliens. Both games have received high praise and thankfully have not remained exclusive to the pocket color. A graphically updated version of First Mission was brought to mobile phones in 2004 as Metal Slug Mobile and were included in the Neo Geo Pocket Color Selection Volume 1 for Nintendo Switch and Steam. Despite the limitations of the Pocket Color, both missions were able to deliver the arcade experience on the go, but they also served as a holdover until the true follow-up to X was ready. Metal Slug 3 debuted in arcades on March 23, 2000, two weeks after Second Mission. Development had begun in the spring of 1998 alongside X. But since the Metal Slug team was split up between both games, Noise Factory, a studio founded by former Atlas staff, was brought in to handle the soundtrack. Set several months after the events of Metal Slug 2, Morden was declared dead and his forces were scattered. Marco and Tarma were ordered to destroy what was left of those still loyal to Morden. Meanwhile, Theo and Eri investigated mysterious kidnappings of livestock and politicians. Metal Slug 3 further expanded upon features from past games. New enemy types included giant crabs and plant creatures. Players could turn into the Walking Dead by phlegm spewing zombies. While this new transformation greatly reduced speed, it gave them projectile vomit that destroyed everything in its path. Also introduced were yetis that could trap players in snow and kill them in one hit. New to the arsenal were thunderclouds and mobile satellites that hovered over players and struck any enemies on screen. The number of vehicles doubled to include the Slug Mariner, Slug Copter, Astro Slug, and Drill Slug. Elephants and ostriches were outfitted with armaments while the LV armor became available to players for the first time. Levels now had branching pathways with differing enemies and vehicles, but no matter which way you chose, all routes led to the same bosses. During the final assault, players discovered that Morden was still alive, but had been kidnapped and replaced by aliens. Fearing for their dear leader's life, the Rebels formed another temporary alliance with the Peregrine Falcons and Sparrows, but this time they would take the fight directly to the Martians.
Once aboard the mothership, players rescued Morden, saved their comrades, and destroyed the Martian hive mind Root Mars, triggering the ship's self-destruct mode in a thrilling escape sequence. But just when players thought they had won, a reawakened Root Mars attacked them as they came hurtling down to Earth in one final battle. <laughs> Though the Martian invasion had stopped a second time, Morden still got away as the corpse of Root Mars sank to the bottom of the ocean. Metal Slug 3 was one of the top three highest grossing arcade games of April in 2000. It came home on the Neo Geo three months later and has since been ported to the PlayStation 2, Xbox, Nintendo Wii, Xbox 360, iOS, Android, PlayStation 3, Windows, Linux, PlayStation Vita, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 5, and Xbox Series X and S. Metal Slug 3 is considered by critics and gamers alike as a high point in the series, and the one game all later entries would be compared to. With three main games and two handheld spin-offs, Metal Slug was growing in popularity among Neo Geo fans. However, what many didn't know is that it would all come crashing down within a few months. Since the mid-90s, SNK had been dealing with severe financial problems. Despite the popularity of the MVS, other members of the Neo Geo family failed to meet the same success. The prohibitively high price of the AES prevented it from reaching the same heights as the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. SNK tried to rectify this with the Neo Geo CD, but it was met with lower sales than its cartridge counterpart due to slow loading times and competition with Sony, Sega, and Nintendo. As the industry moved on to 3D graphics, SNK tried to follow suit by replacing its aging MVS hardware with the Hyper Neo Geo 64 in 1997. However, it didn't receive as warm of a reception and was discontinued after just two years with only seven games. SNK's failure was further exacerbated by the decline of arcades in favor of home consoles that could almost perfectly replicate the arcade experience while offering original titles that didn't eat quarters. SNK's entry into the handheld space fared better, but not nearly enough to put a dent in Nintendo's dominance, with only a 2% market share in North America. In another move that made SNK's situation even worse, the company had also sunk money into the Neo Geo World Amusement Park that did more damage to its bottom line than any piece of hardware. As the looming shadow of bankruptcy came close, Kawasaki made the decision to let SNK be acquired by a pachinko company called Aruze in January of 2000. Many were hopeful this move would save the company, but it would only doom it. Aruze wasn't interested in video games, and only purchased SNK to use their IPs for pachinko and slot machines. Within months, SNK discontinued all operations in North America, while their development teams were purposely cut off from making any more titles. This continued for well over a year, until the inevitable happened. On October 31st, 2001, SNK officially filed for bankruptcy, and Aruze started liquidating all of its assets ending a 23-year legacy. But just before the shutdown, employees had already begun jumping ship to other companies such as Capcom and Arc System Works, while others started their own studios like Breezasoft and Dimps. Kawasaki had also left to form Playmore, with a mission to resurrect the fallen company by purchasing the SNK name and IPs. But a few had fallen in the hands of other publishers. Eolith snatched the King of Fighters series, while Metal Slug went on to Mega Enterprises, a South Korean company that had previously ported Technos and Data East games over to PC in the country. With rights split between the two, both companies worked together along with Noise Factory on resurrecting the series with Metal Slug 4, released on March 27, 2002.
With Morden and his alien allies defeated, a new threat arose from the Amadeus Syndicate, a cyber terrorist group planning to unleash the devastating white baby computer virus upon the world. But during a routine scouting mission, the PFs and Sparrows discovered that Morden was still alive and working with them. Marco and Fio returned, but Ari and Tarma would sit this one out for two new recruits, the silver-haired Trevor Spacey and the spunky Nadia Cassell. Since 4's development cycle was much shorter, it reused many assets from past games. However, not all of it was recycled, as Amadeus soldiers, pirates, and scientists joined the fight. Players can now transform into monkeys, while enemy vehicles such as the Metal Claw and M15A were at your disposal. New vehicles also included the walking machines that resembled mutants from 2, and forklifts that could turn over enemy tanks with occasional help from trucks, land seekers, and helicopters. But 4's biggest feature was its metal-ish system. Picking up emblems triggered a score attack minigame where players had to kill as many enemies within an allotted amount of time. For every enemy killed, you received medals that added to your overall score. Of course, dying ended the minigame, but it could be restarted by picking up other emblems. The reaction to 4 was mixed. Many felt it was inferior to previous entries, and more like an expansion than a true sequel to 3. Still, 4 received several ports. Despite its many issues, Metal Slug 4 came out strong as the second highest grossing arcade game of Spring 2002, showing that even in the face of SNK's demise, Metal Slug still survived. Metal Slug 5 was first revealed at E3 2003 and would launch worldwide on November 13th. Mega would continue to work on the series with Noise Factory and the newly renamed SNK Playmore. With the Amadeus Syndicate defeated, Marco, Tarma, Ari, and Fio were now after the Polemic Army, a cult that had been raiding temples, brainwashing villagers, and stole plans for the next generation of Metal Slugs. 5 was a much more toned down adventure than previous games. Almost all transformations were removed save for getting fat and the flame shot was missing. The combo system from 4 didn't make the cut, but players can now slide dash. Only the Metal Slug, Slug Mariner, and Slug Flyer returned with new vehicles including the Slug Gunner, Augensturm, and Slug Mobile, which had been cut from Metal Slug 2. The finale led players to the Army's mobile tower, home to their demonic god and the largest boss in the series' entire history. Metal Slug 5 was more warmly received by fans than its predecessor, but it marked the end of an era for the series. At the beginning of 2004, SNK announced they would cease all game development for the Neo Geo, with its final game, Samurai Showdown 5 Special, released on April 22nd, ending a 14-year legacy of over 148 titles. With the Neo Geo out of the picture, SNK began looking at other platforms to expand their franchises. Wow. 2001 saw the launch of the Game Boy Advance. For a small system, it boasted a 32-bit processor with 2D graphics that could almost replicate the Neo Geo. With the GBA breaking sales records, it was a clear choice for the series to continue. Metal Slug Advance was released in Europe and Japan at the end of November 2004, while North American fans would have to wait two weeks later in early December. Taking the reins this time was two new PF recruits, Walter Ryan and Tyra Ellison. Their training mission was crashed by rebel forces planning to turn the unnamed island into their own base of operations. Gameplay from the Pocket Color games returned, but this time the level count was kept at only 5. New to the series were cards that could be collected during the adventure from enemies and POWs. 
Of course, they weren't just for show, as some add a permanent boost to your ammo count, firepower, and unlock new slugs. Metal Slug Advance was a surprise for many critics, as the game was able to retain the series' fast and frantic gameplay on such a small screen. Unfortunately, Metal Slug Advance was not as successful as SNK had hoped, and received a very small print run. Since then, it has become a highly sought after collector's item, but has not received any other re releases. With a second chance at life, SNK Playmore put an even greater focus on consoles. Doing so not only saw more of their arcade titles being available to modern systems, but embracing their more powerful 3D graphics. This wasn't new territory for SNK, having developed titles for the Hyper Neo Geo 64 and PlayStation 1. However, the mixture of more powerful next-gen hardware and easy-to-use graphic engines allowed them to do more at a quicker pace. With the 10th anniversary of Metal Slug coming up, SNK would bring the series into the third dimension. The simply titled Metal Slug released for the PlayStation 2 in Japan on June 29, 2006. SNK planned to bring it to North America and Europe as Metal Slug 3D, but ultimately chose to release the anthology collection instead. Set after the events of Metal Slug 5, Morden and his rebel forces were thought to have been defeated, but were able to regain their strength with the help of Keywald Agama president of Ogama Enterprises. The jump to 3D meant major changes while retaining the series' classic run-and-gun action. Your weapons were now permanently added to your arsenal. They could be cycled through while the knife received its own dedicated button for melee attacks. Every weapon from past games returned with a new lock-on feature that helped you keep your aim on enemies. Metal Slugs weren't just at your disposal, but were completely customizable with blueprints found in each level. They could be purchased using gold bars you collected during the adventure. The Slug Mariner and Flyer appeared in their own special levels, but couldn't be upgraded. The Peregrine Falcons and Sparrows tracked down Morden and Agama to a former regular army base in the Arctic, where a powerful weapon called the Alator resided. However, Morden was betrayed by Agama, revealing that he was of the Tawatha Dinang, a technologically advanced race from Earth's past. To prevent their race from self-destructing, the Tawatha created the Alator to collect information on human history for 300 million years, and erase any timeline that clashed with their vision of the future. The two-part boss battle had our heroes fighting Agama and one of his failed experiments. With the Tawatha defeated, Agama got away, but not before handing Rumi Aikawa a disc, containing all information on his people in hopes that humans could learn from their past mistakes. Metal Slug's attempt at 3D didn't land perfectly. Clunky controls, a camera that wanted you dead, and poor graphics made the whole thing fall flat. Despite these issues, however, it still fared better than other franchises' attempts at 3D. It also wouldn't be the only Metal Slug released that year. With the Neo Geo gone, SNK Playmore found an arcade alternative with the Atomis Wave, an arcade system by Sammy Corporation based entirely on Sega Dreamcast hardware. SNK Playmore signed on to make five titles for the platform, chief among them being Metal Slug. Though the arcades were in a steady decline, the series' 10th anniversary was reason enough to bring it back to where it all started. Metal Slug 6 showed up in Japanese arcades on February 22nd, 2006.
set between the events of Metal Slug 3 and 4, the Rebels and Aliens reform their alliance to stop a new alien threat. Though reluctant to join their longtime enemies, the Peregrine Falcons and Sparrows had no choice but to join the war to save Earth and Mars from the invaders. For the first time since Metal Slug 2, the character count jumped up to 6, to include Ralph Jones and Clark Still from Ikari Warriors. Players can now choose an easy mode which gave you a heavy machine gun as your starter, while hard mode unlocked the final level. Each player was given two slots to hold weapons they collected, and a new combo system added score multipliers. Each character now had their own special skills. Marco's handgun firepower doubled, Slugs had a higher endurance and double ammo with Tarma, Airy held more grenades, Theo started with the heavy machine gun, Ralph used faster knives, and Clark could perform his super Argentine backbreaker on enemy soldiers for a short burst of immunity. During the final assault on the invader's underground base, one of your comrades were kidnapped and possessed by one of the aliens. Defeating them forced them out of commission for the final showdown with the invader king. As the invader king fell to its death, the character and your incapacitated friend were saved by Morden. Metal Slug 6 saw a standalone release on the PlayStation 2 in Japan, which was made available on the PlayStation 3. It was only available in North America and Europe as part of the Metal Slug Anthology for PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable, Nintendo Wii, and PlayStation 4. In 2020, a homebrew developer going by the name of Megavault 85 successfully reverse-engineered the Atomas Wave, making Metal Slug 6 and several titles playable on the Dreamcast. Though Metal Slug 6 was a hit, the steady decline of arcades ensured the series would never return to the venue it was born from. One year later at Tokyo Game Show, a seventh chapter in the Metal Slug saga was announced to return on handhelds, but this time it would be a numbered entry. Metal Slug 7 showed up on the Nintendo DS in Japan on July 22, 2008. Ignition Entertainment brought it to North America on November 18, while it wouldn't invade Europe until February 29, 2009. First-run copies of the American version came with a foil slipcover, poster, and a mini-DVD containing trailers for upcoming games. While the world was recovering from the terrestrial and interstellar wars, the Peregrine Falcons, Sparrows, and Ikari Warriors were busy chasing down Morden and his rebel forces to a floating scrap heap called Garbage Isle. But their fight only got more difficult when a portal brought rebels from the future into the present. The combo system, weapon slots, and character attributes from 6 returned, while the difficulty expanded to include three levels. Though the final mission was no longer locked behind the hard mode, only one new weapon was introduced with Thunder Shot that fried enemies with electricity. Classic slugs were joined with the new slug trolley that linked up with other rail tanks. The LV armor from past games got an upgrade with a slug variant in addition to the indestructible slug gigant. Metal Slug 7 was met with positive reviews, but lacked features from previous games like multiplayer and alternate routes. Thankfully, they would return in an enhanced version called Metal Slug Double X that included these features and more. Double X was first released on the PlayStation Portable and later found its way to the PlayStation 4, Steam, and Xbox 360, which is also backwards compatible with all later Xbox systems. This version also made Leona Hydran from The King of Fighters available as DLC. Metal Slug 7 and Double X mark the chronological end of the series, as no numbered sequels have been released since.
with the main series ended, Metal Slug has mostly continued through various mobile titles. Since 2004, over 25 mobile games have been released bearing the Metal Slug name for iMode, Java, iOS, and Android. While most of them have been shut down, only two are still in service, Metal Slug Defense and Awakening. During a Nintendo Direct in 2021, Metal Slug Tactics was announced to be in development by Like Your Studios and published by .emu. Tactics will combine turn-based strategy gameplay with the series' signature aesthetics when it releases sometime in 2023. Since its debut in 1996, characters and locations from Metal Slug have appeared in other SNK titles. Theo appeared as a non-playable striker in The King of Fighters 99 Evolution and 2000. Her only appearance as a fighter was as a secret character in The King of Fighters Maximum Impact 2. Marco joined the fight in Neo Geo Battle Coliseum along with a Martian, who made a previous appearance as a playable boss in SNK vs. Capcom Chaos. More recently, a Metal Slug-inspired stage was added to the King of Fighters 15. Metal Slug has also been a major influence to other one-and-gun titles from Alien Hominid, Mercenary Kings, Aqua Ipan, and Krautbusters. For over a quarter century, Metal Slug has entertained and inspired generations of gamers and developers with its bright explosions and dark humor. Even if the series never returns to arcades, Metal Slug's legacy will continue on as one of the greatest games to come out of the Neo Geo. All right, folks, and that was the Metal Slug Retrospective. I just want to take a moment to thank every single one of you for watching this. What you just saw was about six months of work. Yeah, it took me a long time to get this one done, but it came out exactly the way I, want, I wanted it to, so I'm happy with the final product. Uh, the last retrospective I did, which was Dead Space, that took me four months, and I'm not doing that ever again. It just wasn't enough time to let me do what I really wanted to do with the series and didn't come out. I'm not happy with the final product. So um, maybe one day I'll go back and remake it. I would like to do that. Same thing with Panzer Dragoon. But uh, right now I have to focus on the very next retrospective, which is planned for sometime in December, which is also somewhat of a hint as to what it is. Pretty much, it's one of my all-time favorite franchises, so I'm really looking forward to uh, getting that done. So far, I've already recorded some gameplay footage. I have half the notes taken, so I'm actually pretty ahead, ahead of schedule on that. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty confident that that will get done by December. So anyway, I'm going to take a break now. I I'm just, I'm tired. <laughs> You know, I've been working on this thing for a really long time. All of my free time has been spent, like, working on this. So, uh, I'm gonna, like, take a week off. And then, you know, maybe next Monday, get right back into it. So, anyway, until the next retrospective, I want to thank you all for listening. I'll see you next time. And remember to keep gaming. <laughs>